Hello, I am Nicole Arna. I am a research fellow at the Florence School of Regulation and I am also the scientific coordinator of the Loyola de Palacio Chair at the European University Institute. Today I'm here because I have been asked to give you some insight into what is happening right now in Germany, which is namely the exemption from the energy incentive industries from the obligation to pay the network charges. And uh, this is especially of interest if we look at the current developments we are witnessing in the area of energy and state aid. In fact, the case of Germany is not only interesting because it leads to a lot of discussion, it's also very interesting because it's more than illustrative to point out the crucial points when it comes to the question if we are dealing with uh, unlawful state aid or not. So let's come right away to the point and let's see what is happening in Germany. So the starting point of all of this was in 2011 when the regulation on network charges in Germany has been amended. And from this time on, in its paragraph 19, there is a special rule foreseen, which says that in cases where the energy incentive industry, which is defined by uh, meeting the threshold of a minimum of 7,000 hours uh, use and a minimum of 10 gigawatt per hour uh, gross energy consumption uh, is reached, these undertakings that are in this position may apply for an exemption to pay the network charges. So if you think about who will be able to meet this threshold, you may imagine that this will of course only be the large-scale energy users and the, the big industries, for example the paper or the chemical industries. From a procedural point of view, there is also the role of the Bundesnetzagentur, which is the German energy regulator. So in case that an undertaking or the energy user is in the situation to possibly meet this threshold, as said, the 7,000 hours and the 10 gigawatt minimum, they may apply to the Bundesnetzagentur to get a total exemption from the network charges. So this was a procedure and the question we now have to ask ourselves, in those cases where all these big industries are not paying the network charges, who will pay for them? And also here we find the answer in this paragraph 19 of the German uh, regulation on network charges, the so-called in Germany Strom uh, NEV. So let's have a look how this works in practice so that you will understand what I'm speaking about. So as I said, you see if the legal conditions are fulfilled and we have the 7000 hours and this uh, 10 gigawatt of use, the grid operator or also those undertakings that fulfill this criteria, they may apply to the German energy regulator, the Bundesnetzagentur, which will then verify if these conditions are met and in the case they are, will give an authorization. This is the procedural side. Now we have to see who will pay for those charges, for the lost revenues, what will happen with the TSO and DSO who are facing those lost revenues. They are invoiced to the upstream grid operators and how this works in practice. We should again look at our illustration to understand better who is doing what in this kind of uh, apportionment or compensation mechanism. So based on a method which is, which is given by law, in our case the TSO will calculate uh, the amount. It will then invoice it to the DSO and based on a binding decision by the Bundesnetzagentur, the DSO is obliged to collect the so-called, it's a paragraph 19 surcharge or apportionment, collect and pass it on to the final end consumer. So in the end it will be paid then to the TSO, but you see that the end consumer is the one who is paying it. Then also you will see in our illustration there is also some sort of control which is not, note this, it's not a control of the paragraph 19 surcharge, it's a control, a general control the Bundesnetzagentur has on the uh, network costs and revenues of the TSOs and DSOs. What happened since uh, December 2011 is that the European Commission received several complaints, not only from consumer associations, but even private letters of uh, private consumers. And they were all stating or complaining that the state conduct of Germany is unlawful and constitutes an incompatible state aid. Now, the preliminary investigation led to some arguments between Germany and the Commission, whereas Germany stated that this is not at all a case of state aid, whereas the European Commission 
uh, really argued in the other direction. Now, a few weeks ago only, it was in March 2013, the European Commission informed Germany that it initiated the formal investigation procedure and the preliminary conclusion of the European Commission is that in fact they see here a, state, a case of state aid, of unlawful state aid. The question now is, is this really a case of unlawful and incompatible state aid? And uh, here's the point where Article 107 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union comes in, because it's the only paragraph which provides for the def definition, what does it mean, state aid, which is according to the provision, any aid granted by the state or through state resources in any form whatsoever. You see it's a very broad definition. And if you now follow the legal doctrine, they derive basically four conditions that have to be met in order to answer the question if we have illegal or unlawful stated or not in the affirmative. And this is first, we need a selective advantage, which is kind of favoring certain industry or products. This must be granted by the state or through state resources. The third is um, it must distort or at least threaten to distort competition and also have an effect of the trade between the member states. The crucial point, and we will not go into detail in the others, because the crucial point here, you may already suggest which it is, it's the question, is this aid, the economic advantage we here have in Germany for the energy incentive industry, is it really granted by the state or even through state resources? If you look at the ratio for this uh, condition, it is to differ differentiate between private and state conduct. So we really need to see, is this really the state acting here? And if you try to answer the question yourself, you will see it's not clear cut. Or are you able to give the answer already or right now? So on first sight, it may really look as if the state is not involved, just from the broad picture. If you see, it is a, are the consumers and consumers that are paying and the TSOs and the DSOs are involved in this kind of uh, compensation or apportionment mechanism. In fact, now, if you look at the arguments exchange, you see that Germany is pointing out mainly that this uh, advantage for this industry is financed through private means, as I said before. The surcharge or the apportionment does not transit at all through the uh, German state budget. So it is not uh, given through state resources. On the other hand, the European Commission argues that the concept of state resources within the meaning of this Article 107 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union does not at all require that the, finance, the financial res resources transit through the state budget. And if you look at the arguments exchange, you will find um, that they are mainly, not, at, not completely, but mainly, or in essence, are referring to two different cases. So let's have a look at these two cases. The first one is the Preussen Electra case from March 2001, which seems to be the one Germany is referring to in its argumentation. So subject matter of this case was the German feed-in system of 1998. Here the German law foresaw that private electricity distributors were obliged to buy green electricity in their area of supply to a fixed minimum price, which was higher than the market price. Obviously, this was an advantage for the uh, green energy producer. And here, the European Court of Justice ruled that we have no case of state aid. And as a reason, it was referring to the fact that the economic advantage of the renewable energy producer basically relied on private resources and neither on a direct nor indirect transfer of public money. Conversely, and this is the other case, it's the so-called ascent network case, which the European Commission seem to refer to here in this uh, reasoning. Here, the European Court of Justice considered a surcharge being of state origin despite only private actors have been involved. And subject matter of this case was a Dutch legislation which provided a surcharge on the price for electricity to pay certain stranded costs. The special point here was also here were only private parties involved, but because, and this is what the European Court stated, because the money always remained under public control and cannot be used for other purposes than those provided for by the law, 
It agreed or answered this question, do we have state resource or not, in the affirmative. So if you see the difference also to the previous case is that the key element here was the control element of the state. There was a similar case, we will not go into detail, the similar case was uh, the Green Electricity Act uh, in Austria. And also in this case, the fact that the government exercised control over the way the private undertaking that collected, in this case a charge, and allocated the proceeds was decisive for the court to uh, agree that we have a case of state aid. Now, if we apply all of this to our case, we want to go back or we will go back to our illustration and try to apply what we learned so far from these short sentences out of the cases. So, if we look what happened in Germany, we see that Germany has imposed a spe special surcharge on electricity consumers that is designated to finance the advantage of the large energy consumer. The TSOs administer the charge, we may say, Germany established by law the rules governing the use and destination of the surcharge. The methodology, as we saw already in the beginning, to calculate is given by the German regulator, the Bundesnetzagentur. Then that the surcharge does not pass through the state budget doesn't seem to matter. So against this background, it seems that the European Commission really seems to consider the very strong control element that the state has. But we, however, we need to see how this uh, proced procedure will end. It remains to be seen if the control that uh, we see here is sufficient. Moreover, as we said before, the Article 107 has four criteria, not only one. Also those need to be fulfilled. And also there is still the possibility to declare it compatible with the internal com common market uh, if the conditions of the preceding uh, paragraphs of Article 107 are fulfilled. This case, as said, is not decided. So what we can say in a conclusion for us now is that uh, even though we cannot foresee how this will end and there is no official opinion of the European Court of Justice yet, we may witness a shift from a very restrictive uh, interpretation towards a very extensive interpretation. Restrictive in the sense that through state resources being an essential element to constitute state aid, with a consequence that many measures fall out of the scope of scrutiny of the European Commission towards leaning on the cases in Essen or uh, also in the Austrian electricity case, a very extensive interpretation with the consequence that more and more national measures are categorized as state aid by the European Commission with, as a consequence, a very much extended scope of uh, scrutiny of the European Commission. So what we may say as an overall conclusion of this topic is that in case of financing mechanisms, the criterion of state resources or granted through state resources may in the future only be denied if the administration is completely in private hand and not under state control. Thank you.